Thank you. It's great to see all of you here today supporting NEAR. Congratulations to those being inducted this year to the NEAR Hall of Fame. You will be joining a, a elite group of people. This year's Ron Bouchard Lifetime Achievement Award goes to a man who never let life's obstacles get in his way. His love of racing transcended his everyday difficulties. This year's award goes to Ricky Roduca. Eddie Wolf, he... <laughs> well, to, to, to use some advice from my friend Mike Joy, you're supposed to start with a joke. So this is one time starting on the pole really sucks. Okay. okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today and for supporting this great event. And thank you, Paula, for trusting me to speak on behalf on the, of the Bouchard family. This year's recipient is quite different and unique. I believe this will be the first race fan to be honored this way, but Rick Paducah isn't just a race fan. He's a race fan who managed to find a way to support himself while he helped race teams support themselves by connecting them with sponsors. I first met Rick in 1972, his sophomore year at New Britain High School. He was a seemingly carefree, long-haired, quick-witted kid buzzing around in his wheelchair like he owned the place. We ran into each other a few times, and in one of, in one of our chats, he mentioned he would, went to the races <clears throat> at Plainville Stadium, and my father was one of his favorites. And an instant bond was formed. Knowing I was a flimkey, he took full advantage of asking me every question possible, and the questions never seemed to end. One day, I, tur I turned the tables on him and, and said it was my turn to ask him some questions. I wanted to know what made him who he was and how he coped with his world. <clears throat> he gladly answered my questions and our friendship grew ever stronger. I'd like to share a couple of conversations we had with you. Rick told me how invisible he felt even though Everyone obviously saw him, but they usually never took the time to interact with him. Most people would stare, but when eye contact was made, they would either look away or smile politely or nod and go on their way. I didn't really want to believe this, but he insisted what he was saying was true. <clears throat> he, then he said to me, I'll prove it. Stay right here and watch. By the way, we were in the lobby of a McDonald's restaurant at this time. Rick wheeled away over to where people were waiting in line and flipped himself out of his wheelchair onto the floor. He just lay there for about 10 or 15 seconds and then quietly started to moan and asking for someone to help him. Well, most looked away, some, <laughs> some smiled politely, then looked away. One actually asked him if they could call someone for him, but no one actually helped him. Having seen enough, I went over and helped him get back in his wheelchair. That lesson will stick with me forever. We traveled a lot together in the mid 80s, running not only the SK Modified, but also the IMSA GTP light car owned by Paul Carrazzo. Many long trips made the Many long trips were made those years along the East Coast, taking toll on Ricky's body. To help him be more comfortable in the hauler, I built him a custom seat and mounted it between the two front seats and our cube van. We were hoping it would help him feel better longer, but eventually the discomfort would creep in and his whining and complaining would amp up. It seemed we couldn't stop, and stop enough for him at times. One trip, he was complaining way more than usual, and even after we threatened him that if he didn't stop, we were going to leave him on the side of the road, it, it just kept coming. <laughs> he wouldn't stop. <clears throat> I hadn't, finally, I had enough, and without thinking, 
I elbowed him in the chest and said, that's it, we're leaving on the side of the road. Now he was yelling at me, using language <clears throat> I can't repeat here, and said, <clears throat> sorry, I, th I, think you broke I think you broke my ribs, you jerk, <laughs> and vowed he would pay me back somehow. Needless to say, we stopped at the very next rest area to take care of his needs. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sorry. Now, our usual routine was I would get out of the van, get his wheelchair out, go get him, carry him to his chair, put him in his chair, and go do our thing. But this time, to save time, I just picked him up and carried him into the restroom. After he was ready, I picked him up and headed to the exit door. Well, just as I got to the door, he grabs the divider and starts yelling, Help! Help! He's trying to kidnap me. Somebody call the cops. Well, as you can imagine, <laughs> I'm thinking this isn't going to end well. <laughs> Next thing I know, this guy comes over and opens and holds the door for me. No questions, no cops, smiling, and walked away. Once again, no one actually helped. With this being said, Rick has always said the racing people never made him feel this way and always offered to help him any way they could. Racing is where he felt most at home and appreciated. One of our other conversations we had way back then was that people with his condition usually wouldn't live to celebrate their 30th birthday. Wow. At that time, Rick was 15. <clears throat> our, conver our conversation came to an uncomfortable pause. Then to break that sil silence, I jokingly said, well, Ricky, usually the best part of a 30-lap race is the last 15 laps. We somehow managed to laugh it off. But now I'm thinking they were wrong. Somehow, Rick, you've turned that 30-lapper into the 1973 spring, spring sizzler. Thank you for letting me share these life lessons with our racing family, Rick. And thank you for never giving up. You are, you are the absolute definition of perseverance. Now it is with great pride, I turn the floor over to this year's recipient of the Ron Bouchard's Lifetime Achievement Award, Rick Vitoka. <clears throat> to Skip Matzik and to Paul Bouchard Damn it. for thinking of me and believing in my work to be inducted with the Ronnie Bouchard Lifetime Achievement Award. I don't actually remember when my addiction to racing began, but I think it had a lot to do with my grandfather and uncles giving me matchbox cards each time I was a patient at Newington Hospital for crippled children. By the time I was eight or nine years old, I had a pretty good sizable collection of Indy cars, Grand Prix, and K&M cars. Where we lived in New Britain, we could easily hear the noise from Plainville Stadium. It was a sound I really wanted to get closer to. So one Saturday, my dad brought me to the races, and believe it or not, I was really disappointed. The cars at Plainville had dents, they had holes, they smoked, and they crashed. They were nothing like my miniature matchbox. <laughs> But early next season, a friend that I had known from the track invited me to go with him and his dad. Now I was at the races with boys my age. And as a kid in the wheelchair in the early 60s, not only did that night change my perception of racing, it began a dramatic shift to my entire life. In 1976, I'd saved enough money to finally begin building a van that I could drive. The Department of Motor Vehicle didn't have anything for my level of disability, so my mom had to be my driving instructor. 
we drove mainly in parking lots and side streets, and we would go to the Sherry Cup Frey shops early in my driving career. When it was time for me to go on the highway, I asked my mom if we could go to the Flunky family's race workshops in East Hartford. So we went that day, and as I'm at race works, showing off my van, my mom reading her book, Eddie Flunky Sr. comes over and says, hey, next week we're going to Seekonk if you'd like to come along with us. So that was a pretty cool thing. The next Saturday, that morning, I drove slow, my first solo to the Manchester Sand and Gravel shops. It was a big like, train station thing there. And that's where we met. And I didn't want to waste anybody's time, but here. <laughs> but, but I opened my van doors, I opened the lift, I'm getting out. As I'm doing that, everybody starts jumping in. Eddie Jr., Kenny Bouchard, and I think Bob Bruno, uh, the engine guy, and then finally Eddie Clinton Sr. gets into the passenger seat and says, okay, we're all set. I wasn't going to tell him I only driven 30 miles <laughs> and, and 20 miles of it on the highway, you know. So, but everything went fabulous. Uh, we went to Seekonk. On the way there, Eddie would, didn't, didn't give me any backseat driving, any of that. He would tell me where the best restaurants were, where to stop for ice cream, and then where the cops might be hiding. <laughs> got into that speed limit. So now there was a way, oops, sorry. Eddie would tell me a lot of things over the next, you know, ride that we did. But then when we got to Seacorn, he introduced me to Ron Bouchard. I learned about his kindness and how good it was to be around somebody with his stature. And from then on, I wanted to follow him wherever he raced. We went Trenton and Pocono and of course Seekonk. Um, I, I didn't have to follow him to Stafford because I lived in there Stafford. But these days, those that desire to go and watch Ryan, um, it, it demonstrated to me that I was capable of driving anywhere, anytime that I wanted to. As I look over this room, my mind goes back to a lot of conversations. Goes back to meeting with a lot of racers and even working with a lot of the people that are here. I've worked with 13 different Hall of Famers that are in this room today. And it's really good to know that I'm now finally a part of this community. Thank you.